All right, everybody, welcome to another great episode here of Leap Into the Week. As always, I've got uh, my partner here, Patrick Fingles, to bring you immense value here on your Monday morning. Uh, Patrick, first of all, man, thank you very much for joining us again here. And uh, get to go week seven right here, brother. Week seven, man. They're flying by. They are flying by. And thank you for everybody who's tuning in right now. If you've missed uh, weeks one through six, make sure you go back and watch them. Uh, the radio episode and some of those week one and two ones were absolutely incredible. Start from the beginning. It'll bring some great value to your contract and company. Now, many of people out there, Patrick, they're, they're maybe in that first five years, brother. Um, okay. They're beginning their journey as a contractor. Perhaps they were the quintessential sales rep who went out on their own, brother. Or they, you know, they were in the production field and said, I can do this in various aspects. You've done this, man. You're not only working with contractors day in, day out but you built a successful contracting company. I'd like to start more broad, if it's okay, and ask you, you know, were there some things that you would have changed in the beginning, some first steps that you would have taken in the beginning and do differently, uh, perhaps looking back on it now? Nah, man, we did everything perfect the first go around. <laughs> ah, I get it. I'm just kidding, yeah. Uh, most definitely learned a lot along the way. Um, and so two, two lessons that I've learned, and this is the thing, you know, you try to create, we'll call it fresh content, right? We want to give the listener something new. However, uh, you know, there's, you know, you have like a kind of a pyramid or, you know, your playbook and it, it's like a great, it's like a great, uh, a great guitar solo. Everything goes back to the same three notes. So some of what I've talked about has come up in discussions in previous episodes. So I want to talk about two things that I've learned along the way. Uh, one thing I learned was operating states and I'm going to just rattle them off again, operating states, the things we talked about, right? It's what operating state is your business in what operating state is maybe your sales department in your production department in, you know, uh, your service department. So operating states are kind of like the five areas of, of a business. So it's formulation, concentration, momentum, stability, and crisis. And that's sequential order. So the first thing you do is you go into formulation. We're forming ideas. We go into concentration. We're executing those ideas. We go with the momentum. The ideas are starting to work. We go into stability. Results are known. And then we go into crisis. We got off track. Something changed in the environment. It's not working anymore. We got to go back either to the beginning or we got to get back on track. Right? Uh, and you know, a lot of times when you start a business, you're just, you're not operating in that context. You're operating in just life and you're dealing with challenges. You're thinking of new opportunities, you're executing new ideas, and you're not going through those operating states. So when you're new in business, had I known, okay, let's sit down, let's form, let's put a plan in place. All right, great. Let's go into concentration and let's like execute this plan and measure the results of that. And it doesn't need to be the whole business plan. It could be a simple sales strategy. It could be, we want to spin up canvassing. So, you know, just understanding those, 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 uh, those, those operation states helps you, um, to know like what you're working on. And then, so I read another thing. I just would, you know, I read a book uh, later in life. It's called atomic habits. It's one of my favorite things. You know, like atomic habits is it's exactly what it sounds. It's like you have a habit. Just make that thing atomic. And then what a lot of people do is when something's working and it's working well, they want to evolve that. thing. That's different than, hey, we want to evolve the business, but let's keep this thing that's working, working really well. For instance, you know, we have sales guys, they're selling roofing. Uh, we want to start getting into solar. We're going to train our sales guys how to sell solar and we're going to break the whole damn sales team. Now we can't even sell roofing anymore. We screwed everything up. There's a different way to do it where it's like, hey, we're going to keep the sales guys selling solar. We're going to take one or two of the guys. We're going to keep that atomic habit for majority of the group. We're going to take one of the two of the guys. And we're going to go over here and test. So I always moved very confidently and quickly if the idea was solidified in my head. And I didn't embrace atomic habit strategy. And I did not embrace operating states. And if I would have done those earlier in my career, I'd be much farther along. Love that. The operating states, which I've heard you talk about before, the habits, but they work. Um, and creating those atomic habits, like you said, is where people begin to separate themselves. I, I've got a question for you here about, you know, that first five years of a business, Patrick, a lot of contractors are hearing now on Facebook, Instagram, wherever they're wherever they're at, about 
I don't know, private equity coming in and, you know, preparing your business for selling. All right. Sometimes though, in that first five years, because man, I'm there too in my business, it can seem like sometimes you're just kind of treading water, brother. Um, mm -hmm. Like you're just trying to keep it going. I'm interested if you could go back and do it all over again, would you have paid more attention to your end goal and selling and moving the business on from the business? Or was it okay to kind of just, hey man, we're here in the moment now, we're figuring out what we are, we're, we're, we're in and we're, we're treading water, I know, but this is an important stage. I'm curious how you would do it going back to that beginning right there. Yeah, it's funny. I just I did a uh, I did a webinar with a qualified remodeler yesterday. I think yesterday live webinar um, on selling the businesses um, because I have two under my belt and I have one purchase under my belt as well. Um, and so you know, for me, yes, yes, I would have been very prescriptive of what our goals were. Uh, I did that with Leap. I did not do that with New Look. New Look was just kind of like more organic. Me personally, I would have done it. However, there's a lot of people out there that they're not, believe it or not, they're not goal oriented. Um, meaning they not, that's the wrong word. Um, they're not maybe money motivated. They're, they're passionate about trying to solve a pain point, right? Um, they're, uh, and they're doing their business to, to solve a need or a pain point. And in those scenarios, um, yeah, those people kind of throw a caution to the wind because they're not on a timeline. They're on, you know, they're on a timeline to solve this problem and it's going to be a forever battle. They already know it because it's, you know, it's unsolvable. So there's only mitigation, you know, or whatever. So, um, you know, depending on the business model, it can vary widely. But if you're like, no, I'm starting a business, I'm, I'm money motivated. I want to build my business. I want to exit my business. Then yes, figuring that out much earlier. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I said on my podcast yesterday, I didn't think about selling our biz businesses until it was actually my cousin. He was an insurance, a life insurance salesman. He said to me, he said, Hey man, you know, you know, there's only four ways your business ends. And I don't know which way you want to plan for, but there's four ways and you should plan for them regardless. And remember he's selling life insurance. He's like, you go out of business. You give it away or it gets taken from you. You die or you sell it. Like, that's it. And I was like, huh. And like immediately I was like, well, no, I'd like to sell my businesses. I don't want to give them away, <laughs> go out of business or die. Right? Like I want to sell them. So that was a real change for me, you know? Um, but there's other people, like I said, you have a business, you're doing something, you're passionate about it. And you're like, no, I'm going to do this till the day I die. And when I die, hopefully somebody takes over my legacy, one of my children or one of my employees. Then no, you won't think about that. You'll have a different goal. So it, it does vary a little bit, but I think the vast majority are interested in probably, you know, they're money motivated. They're looking for a retirement goal. They're getting into contracting. You know, they maybe they're passionate about it, but they're doing it for the dollars. And if that's the case, yeah, I would think about, you know, those four scenarios. And you're like, well, obviously selling my business is the best outcome for me. So Let's start planning for that now. Absolutely. Patrick, can I get a little granular there with you? Because I like what you just said right there. Start planning for it now. If you were just starting the business, what would be the first step you would make within that plan to look for selling the business somewhere down the future? Would you hire a CPA, get your books in order? Would you get a, a CRM? Let's plug and leap a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Like how, how, What's that first step that you take to make that plan? Yeah, so... Businesses, the, the most number one, no matter what, like we talked about this yesterday, we talked about the things that are, that you value a business on and then the kind of like alternative things that businesses are valued on. And then I had this slide, it says, but no matter what, you got to have the data. It's proof. Mm -hmm. People, you know, the reason that, you know, contractor businesses haven't been rolled up in masses years ago is because people that buy businesses, whether that be private equity you know, they, they, they look at, they audit the business and a, and a lot of construction businesses, there's nothing to audit. You know, you like audit my QuickBooks, which is kind of shabby. You know, there's not audit my Manila folders. There's nothing to audit. So they've had a hard time coming in to businesses, even if they're doing five, six, $7 million, which is a totally sellable asset, by the way, they start trying to open the books up and there's nothing to see. You don't know what your margins are. You don't know what your margin by job is. You don't know what your time to install is. You don't know what your percentage of survey is. 
You don't know what the lifetime cost of maintaining the customer is. You don't know what your ramp time on an employee is. You don't know what your cost to hire is. You don't know any of that. And that's how, you know, investors buy things. They 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 want to know all that because they can look at that and determine the overall health of the business. So anything, a shameless plug, and I said this actually on the, the webinar yesterday, shameless plug, by all means, invest in data early and track everything. Because something that you you don't have to, you just have to have the raw data. Hey, we hired this person on this date. They started running leads on this date. You don't need to track that in a single system. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, how long does it take for you to stand a salesperson up? And you're like, well, God, I never really looked at that. Is there a way we can get at that data? Oh, yeah. We're going to go into our HRIS and we're going to export our salespeople by a higher date. Then I'm going to go into my CRM and I'm going to export the first day they ran a lead. And I'm going to have somebody go into Excel and cross-reference that data. It's going to be a manual process. But I can, at that point in time, spin it up and say from hire to first lead ran, it typically takes us about two and a half weeks. You know, um, so... You know, just having the raw data is really important. So I would say prioritize that over anything else. The earlier you can do it, the better. Number two behind that is your brand and your vision. What's the story? What are you selling? You know, creating a brand for the future. They don't want to, they want to buy your business for today, but they also want to buy what's possible. So if you have a really good vision of what's possible, you know, our goal right now, we're only selling roofing, but our goal is to be a full exterior or model or we know that 30% of our customers would buy another product from us. So if we forecast that out, we think we can pick up another $2 million in revenue over the course of the next 24 months by launching these alternative services. That is a vision. And that's what companies love to buy. They like buying. They like the data of today and the vision and promise of what's possible tomorrow. So, you know, that's that really sums it up. Data of, data of past and today and vision of what's possible for tomorrow. Those are the two most important things. If you're not taking notes like this, man, you just get an opportunity. I get an opportunity here to learn from the best. It's great. Uh, we're here with, we're with Patrick Fingal, CEO over at Leap, leaptodigital.com. Let's go over there. If you need a great CRM, let's go over to Leap to Digital, everybody. Um, we're talking here about the first steps in the business. Uh, Patrick, we've got a few more minutes here. I have a question, maybe a little bit of, a, of one that I've seen out in the field. In all of your time of both working with contractors, being one yourself, is there an area that contractors avoid when they are getting started, maybe that first couple of years, that shouldn't be avoided? They put it off like that stack of paper that gets stuck in the corner and you just keep on not looking at it. Um, is there something that you find in your experience, hey man, you better take this up earlier as a contractor before it gets away from you? Yeah, I think, dude, it's the same thing. Like we were talking before we kicked off here and just sharing a little bit about you trying to grow. I mean, you're in a business, you're trying to grow and scale. You know, I think, I think it's a lot for a lot of people, you know, when you start a contracting company, you go out on your own and you get your first job, your second job, your third job, you install those jobs. You just made $2,000 or $3,000 or $5,000. Mm -hmm. It just becomes, you know, it becomes all encompassing. I mean, you're just like, you're so, you're so proud of that, that I think sometimes you forget, okay, let me, my business is small. It's just me and my brother and my wife is doing our books. And, uh, you know, and I got, uh, you know, I got the one guy that's, uh, you know, I got my crew that's doing the installs. So you kind of run the business in not an unprofessional way. Um, because that would be rude to say, but yeah, kind of like in an unprofessional way, because you kind of have everything right here. It's not necessary to have all that other stuff. You're not going to create you know, a production software to move two jobs through it, right? Like you're not going to create SOPs, you know, uh, standard operating procedures for you and your, your brother, you know, you know, two guys, you know, uh, but you should, you should play business. I know that sounds stupid, but you should play business. Pretend that you're a corporation. You know, New Looks Values was a family business with corporate feel. So from, from inception, I just, I always wanted the company to feel and, and, and be bigger than it, than I, than it was. We had six people, you know, but we had a corporate charter, <laughs> like, you know, I mean, and that was, maybe it was vain or whatever, but I really think that helps. So play business like, Hey, no, we have to have operational procedures. Monday morning, we have our ops meeting. 
it's only the three of us. Like I talked to you twice, three times. I talked to each one of you six times yesterday, but we have these very kind of put structure in your business early. I think that really helps. I think that really helps because when you do those things, you want to add to it. You're like, man, I don't have an offer meeting with two people in it. I, you know, we need to get more sales. In order to get more sales, I've got to hire a salesperson. Now I have job description for a salesperson that I created. I got standard operating procedures. I got a system that my guy can sell out of or my girl, you know? Um, and so, you know, putting those things in place is playing business early, but then you have to, you know, it, I think it helps you sooner before you know you're no longer playing business and you're just, you're just in a big business. Man, I'm, now, I'm taking that with me. I'm stealing it, Patrick. Play business early. Um, yeah, man. I want to ask you this. Uh, to, uh, the final question I have for you about these beginning stages of a company is more of a, maybe a personal one for the contractors out there. Maybe you've been in this state where it feels a little bit overwhelming in the beginning, man. You're doing so many of the jobs and wearing so many different hats. And I'm sure there's a guy out there who's going to work right now. He's in the middle of his day listening to this. He's like, Pat, I don't have operating procedures. I feel like I'm just, as a man, as a woman, it's just so much for me to take on right now. Is that normal in your eyes? And and you've, I'm sure you've been there. What do you say to that individual who's who's in that spot right now, just doing so much in their company and, and, and trying to make this thing grow and make an impact? Yeah, I would say, um, I would say, I would say play business. I hate to repeat it, but you know, um, a lot of that frustration and feeling comes from the fact that the work you're doing, I mean, you feel it's like people, they put names on it, like servant leadership, Yeah, you know, um, and when you feel servant or you feel like you're doing something that maybe is beneath you, you know, it's okay to do that for a minute, but like long term, it's not something that you want to do. Um, case in point, get off the road or get off the roof or, you know, I got to get somebody to start doing these sales for me, you know, and I think that's where the overwhelming part comes in. If you are sitting at your desk and you're navigating your team in the field, um, and you are, you know, looking at results from yesterday and figuring out how to improve and increase results. And, you know, you're doing the work that you feel you want to be doing as an owner. Those feelings of frustration kind of subside. They really do. Yeah. So I would say play business, play business. And if you, you if you can't play business because you're in a date with salespeople, then hire sales or you're in a date with sales, you know, or whatever, then hire a salesperson. If you can't play business because you're inundated with um, on site, being on site, you know, trying to keep your jobs on track, I would say hire a project manager, you know, and, and start playing business, have project management meetings with your one project manager, you know, put together a report for project management for your four jobs, you know, and just, you just start to grow that. So I, I would say that that's probably a lot of where that frustration comes from. I, I could have warned you. Because you're doing the thing that you feel you shouldn't be doing. And that's a very frustrating feeling, doing that over and over again. So if you play the business to take those things away, to do the things more of that are going to motivate you and that you love doing, like, you know, looking at the numbers and, you know, figuring out how we're going to grow all the things that you want to do as a somebody who's a planner and somebody's a scaler and a leader, then I think you're going to be in a better position. Folks, we've got Patrick Fingles here with CEO over at Leap. I've got some big takeaways that I'm going to take away from this one, Patrick. The operating states, which I've already loved and used many times. Atomic habits, looking at the data, play business early, and shoot. You know, in the beginning, find a way to do more of the things that you love doing in your business. I really took, you know, find a way for those things that you don't like. Get somebody out there to do them. You're inundated with sales right now. That's a damn good place to be. Oh, no. You'd much rather be in that position than perhaps somewhere else, and I... I, I think there's a lot to be said for what you just put right there. And I love your, you're either going out of business, you're selling, dying, or it's being taken away from you. So it's really your choice what you're going to do. Um, yeah. Folks, if you don't take something away from that, then you're absolutely crazy. Um, all the stuff that Patrick said, of course, go back, watch it, take the notes, and make sure you go over to Leap to Digital, get your CRM, get yourself organized so that you can scale and grow your business better than the competition. Again, that is over at Leap to Digital. Patrick, as always, thank you very much for joining us and all of your input, brother. Thanks, Patrick. I appreciate it.
No problem. Absolutely. Till next time, everybody.